Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here as we continue our study through the book of Acts. And uh, we come to the second half of chapter 4 this morning. And uh, before I read that, let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten us and enliven our hearts, open our minds, uh, give us understanding so that we can not only see the words, but see how we might live because of what it says given the power that you make available to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're looking at chapter 4 of Acts, verses 23, all the way through to the end of the chapter. So let me begin. Now, when they were released, that would be released from the custody uh, because they were preaching the gospel. And they said, well, we can't help but preach the gospel, even if they were uh, admonished not to by the authorities, but they just went right ahead and continued. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Quoting from Psalm 2 there. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who had believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet." Uh, now next week we're going to see a continuation of this with the, the, the very uh, well-known uh, narrative of Ananias and Sapphira. So that's God's inspired word for us today. Now A.W. Tozer, who's, who's written quite a few books in, uh, in his life, he's passed away, wrote one little one called Paths to Power. And he writes about the early church and what characterized the early church at that time. And let me quote, it was not merely an organization, but a walking incarnation of spiritual energy. The church began in power, moved in power, and moved just as long as the Lord gave power. When she forgot the source and no longer had power, she dug in for safety and sought to conserve her gains. But her blessings were like the manna. When they tried to keep it overnight, it bred worms and stank. It is the church that is willing to die to worldly standards that will know the power of Christ's resurrection. Now, that was a, a pretty bold uh, charge against the church at, in his day, and I think it is a charge against the church at our day as well. So before we go any further, I think this begs the question for today's church, just how far outside of the mainstream culture are we willing to be? And really the, the test of that is what serves the best purposes of the church and the furthering of the gospel and what best gives glory to God. Now, the, uh, the uh, philosopher or uh, uh, I call him the hopeless one, uh, Nietzsche, called Christianity the religion of comfortableness. Was he correct to see Christianity as an, an uncourageous, 
uh, convenient system to escape the difficulties of life and the cruelties of the state. Well, certainly we have to admit that there have been times in, in uh, the life of the church uh, and places in history when Christianity has been rather comfortable. Uh, uncourageous, unwilling to embrace the costs of discipleship. And for many in uh, the American church today, Christianity is, is indeed a religion of escape, maybe a religion of comfort, uh, a faith that doesn't ask too much of us in our society today, or it doesn't cost us much. There's not much cost to discipleship, as Bonhoeffer would say. Some see the church as sort of a, uh, what I'll call a universalist, universalistic moral deism, okay? designed to ease our conscience that we're not all that bad, and if we are that bad, God will surely forgive us. But Nietzsche along is, is, was, is wrong to suggest that there's something inherently comfortable about Christianity. The local church was never meant to be a cultural social club, that affirms our own self-centeredness, helps us get along, helps us achieve our best life now. That's not the purpose of the church. On the contrary, it was really meant to be set apart, a community uh, on a hill, uh, that sh a light shining into the darkness, radically, basically radically different from the rest of society. So true relevance for the church comes as we pay less attention to our cultural position and more attention to our position before our Heavenly Father. We must come to terms with the fact that, as John Stott once said, it is not possible to be faithful and popular simultaneously. Jesus said, if the, you know, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the glory of the gospel is that the church, is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts the world. A commitment to pursuing holiness is a critical mark of the church being countercultural because the secular society is typically unholy and we are called to holiness. So the message of the gospel might be countercultural. It is countercultural. The question is are we countercultural? Um, do we live in the same way that the believers of the first century lived as far as living out our faith in the midst of a corrupt world? And well, the answer is, well, we, we should be, but we are not always countercultural. The church is innately countercultural. We must persistently fight against fighting our own self-worth within culture, uh, being judged uh, uh, valuable because culture says we are valuable or successful because culture says we are successful. Uh, we have to fight against our self-worth, our desire for status and honor and power and prestige in anything other than Christ. That is our measuring stick. Martin Luther wrote, if someone could believe with a certain and constant faith and could understand the magnitude of it all, that he is the son and heir of God, he could regard all the power and wealth of all the kingdoms of the world as filth and refuse in comparison with his heavenly inheritance. Whatever the world has that is sublime and glorious would make him sick. If we could grasp and believe for a certainty that God is our Father and that we are his sons and heirs, the world would immediately seem vile to us with everything that it regards as precious, such as righteousness, wisdom, kingdoms, powers, crowns, gold, glory, riches, pleasure, and the like. We would not attach our hearts so firmly to physical things that their presence would give us confidence and their removal would produce dejection and even despair. So what were the characteristics of the early church that made it so successful? And I think our passage lays out for us just a couple of them, and we're going to highlight them as we go through. Now, the first thing is the priority that they gave to prayer. Um, Peter and John come out of prison, or out of uh, being held in detention and, and admonished not to preach the gospel, and they gather with the church, and immediately they all, in one accord, go to the Lord in prayer. They lift up their voices to prayer. Prayer was life. It just was what they did. Uh, there was no thinking, well, what should we do? What, what do you think the next step is? No, let's get together and pray. They didn't have to debate it. They just did it. It was instantaneous, an instantaneous response to the crisis. And I think to some degree our prayer life today is a test 
uh, about our faith and our trust in the Lord. Is, our, is that the first thing that we go to? Uh, prayer or is it the afterthought or do we call somebody else after we have done things and say oh by the way pray for me in this when Luke is telling us of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus about which people really doubted it because he was such an enemy of the church Luke says behold he prays as as a mark of a genuine believer and their praying here in, in Acts chapter 4 is very simple, it's very direct, it's very sincere. They knew God, God was close to them, they, uh, this is still a generation, this is, it's only three months uh, after the death of Christ, it's only uh, two months after uh, Pentecost. They were aware of who God was, um, they were aware of his promises, God said to do it, so they naturally did it, that's what God said to do. So you notice how Luke says that they lifted up their voices together, or some translations say in one accord. It's not that they were praying the same words, it's that they had the same mindset. Uh, we're going to seek the Lord's will, we're going to go before him, we're going to bow before him. They were united as to what it was they were asking God to do. They weren't asking God to protect them from persecution. They weren't asking God to smite the Romans and clean them out. They were asking for more boldness, for more power so that they could preach Christ and the resurrected Christ. They were driven by the same principles and the same goals and the same aspirations, one heart and one soul. And they address God in verse 24 in particular. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord. Now that's an unusual phrase, um, not, not for us today, but in Scripture it's unusual in the fact of the type of word that is used, Sovereign Lord. Well, it's, uh, in the Greek it is despotos, and that's where we get a despotic leader or ruler from. It's a word that uh, is, is, would have been readily associated with power and authority. Now, they don't come before the Lord here and say, Father, won't you, won't you do this? They said, Sovereign, all-powerful Lord, won't you act? They use a word that conveys power and sovereignty and control, and they willingly submit their desires to his work in the world. Now, why did they use that word? Well, this is exactly what they needed uh, at that time. They didn't need to talk about it. Uh, they didn't need to think about it. They needed to approach a sovereign God who is always in control, who is stronger than the Sanhedrin, who wants to arrest uh, anybody who preaches the gospel, um, stronger than the Roman Empire. He's the creator, the one who said, let there be light. He spoke things into existence, and it was. Uh, he created the world from nothing. This is, this is the God that they're addressing, and that's why they use that term sovereign. It's not used very often um, throughout Scripture. And then they begin to quote from Psalm 2. Do whatever your hand, and then, and then as, as a reference they quote it there, and then they move on and say, and do whatever your hand and your purpose is predestined to occur. Now for good Presbyterians, we think, well, see, the, the first century church was a bunch of Calvinists. They just didn't know it at that time. Well, not, not quite. Scripture teaches the predestination very clearly um, in the fact of, uh, in this instance, the foreknowledge of God. The foreknowledge of God deals with God not just knowing what is going to happen, but knowing what is going to happen because he has ordained that it will happen and it serves his perfect will for those things to occur. Um, so what did these early Christians want to know? Well, they wanted to know, is, is God in control? Is, uh, here we are, uh, everybody's trying to kill us. Uh, all we want to do is preach the gospel. All we want to do is carry out the things of the church, and it seems like society wants to kill us. Well, were the events of the last, they, they made a question, were the events of the last two months just kind of haphazard were there by chance was it simply luck or a combination of uh, unrelated factors that had made the church grow from uh, the 500 to to literally uh, 20 or 30,000 at this time in just two months it lists 5,000 men so we must uh, give the assumption as used in other parts in scripture 
that they're not counting the women or the children who were involved in the church at that time as well. So 20, 20 to 30,000 really is, is, a, is a valid uh, estimation of the number of people within the church who are believers at this time. But you see the, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God brought them assurance in everything. The, the doctrine of uh, God's foreknowledge and he, he, his foreordaining and uh, instituting events according to his will brings them this security and this safety that he is in control. He is the sovereign Lord. And that all throughout history, every event, detail, circumstance, all the good things, all the bad things, all the evil things are all part of his plan that he is working out. And he doesn't always tell us how he's working it out, but yet that is what a sovereign God does. Now, you think about that. Uh, you might resist this idea that he's working these things out uh, on a philosophical level. You may think that, well, this is really, this is chance, Randy. It's, 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 it, or it's God has started it and he takes his hands off. Well, then he's not sovereign. He's not in control over everything. We, we might think and look, well, what was the purpose of Calvary? If God was not in control, if he, if he had not from before the foundations of the, the earth predestined this event to happen, that Christ would give his life on the cross, then what purpose does Calvary have? He's the anointed one, the anointed by God, the Messiah. You see what the early Christians are saying. It was all determined by the counsel of God's foreknowledge and according to his will, Peter says something about this in, um, in the first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Um, so really the, the first century Christians took a lot of confidence that it was not chaos, that this was in accord with God's will, whether it be the success of the church or the persecution that they were facing, this was in accord with God's sovereign will. So what did the early church pray for? As I said before, it was not uh, bring, bring peace, Lord, get us out of here, uh, protect us, uh, smite the Romans. It was none of that. They, they prayed for more power. They prayed for more success, more opportunity to share the gospel, to live those things out with boldness and courage. And, and uh, Lord, make us bold. Make us bold. That's what they prayed for. John Wesley once wrote, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. When we no longer fear what men can do to us and we only fear the Lord, well, then we're in our right mind. Then we understand what is really important that we stand before a holy and awesome God and we need to fear him and stand in awe of him but understand at the same time that he has called us into relationship with him and he gives us everything that we need to achieve the work that he calls us to. So Luke moves on and gives us a glimpse into the closeness that the early church experienced at that time. Now, remember, at the day of Pentecost, we're told something very similar to what is being described here happened, namely that uh, the disciples, the, the church, felt such a bond and a closeness and a responsibility to one another that they voluntarily gave up certain rights and privileges um, to look after one another, to look after one another. Now, remember that at Pentecost... Um, it was a Jewish holiday, so Jews from all over um, the, the, the lands at those times, from far away, came to be in Jerusalem at that time. And the Holy Spirit comes, and um, thousands are, are saved at that time. And, and what we can surmise is many, if, if not most of them, stayed in Jerusalem at that time. They, they left whatever it was that they had, wherever they had been, and they, they left that behind, and they stayed in Jerusalem because they wanted to be part of the church, and Jerusalem was the hub. Well, this presented quite a dilemma for those who were in Jerusalem because it was the expectation of hospitality that they would receive these new believers into their home. Now, these new believers had no job. 
uh, whatever they brought with them wouldn't last very long. So the church in Jerusalem had to begin to care not only for itself and the growing numbers, but all these who came from outside of Jerusalem and basically had nothing. So there were very great needs and there's also very great opportunities at this time. So Luke speaks of the unity, heart and soul, uh, mind and heart, all these things. They were unified together um, and they have similar goals, similar aspirations. They identify themselves as the people of God. They're united. They understand, uh, as we would say, that they are the church. They are the body of Christ and great power has come upon them. Preaching, evangelism, their testimony. What do they testify to? The resurrection of Christ, much as Paul will say later, I preach Christ and him crucified. The resurrection, of course, is still just three, three and a half, maybe four months uh, in the past. And, and, and Christ has come to life. He's left the tomb after three days. This is central to their preaching. Um, there were people here who saw the risen Lord. And they know he was dead. They watched him on the cross. They saw him and his resurrected body afterwards. So and with that power in preaching, um, also it's not just, just the preaching, it's also the concern for one another within the church. Not a concern just of, of are, are we doing the job of the church, but are my, am I caring for those in need, those other believers around me? And that that concern manifests itself in the deeds and the deeds were actually caring for one another, sharing in common what they had, their possessions, their land, their property, their financial resources, uh, all, were, were not, all were laid at the apostles' feet and the apostles distributed them as there was need. Now all kinds of questions about this come to the surface. Uh, was this, uh, is this a model for the church today? Is this a model for the Christian life today? Should you all bring, uh, sell all your property and, and bring it to me and let me distribute it? Um, I can tell you, no, don't do that. Uh, my heart's corrupt. I might keep some of it. Who knows? Okay, terrible thing. But Luke is not describing Marxism here. He's not describing communism or socialism here. Um, these types of movements have sprung up in, in the church in various times. The Moravians were, were well known uh, for sharing and having all things in common. Or the Amish are, are very close to that. Not that they have all things in common, but you see, uh, if you want to raise a barn, everybody comes over and helps build your barn. Okay? So Luke is not saying that in the early church there was a prohibition against private ownership. In fact, remember, they're meeting in people's homes, so those homes are still theirs. Uh, they continue to, to meet there. He describes their homes, and then they belong to these people. In fact, in Acts chapter 12, he'll describe the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. It's in her home that they're meeting. Um, Clement of Alexandria, when he was preaching a series on uh, Acts about 100 years later in the second century, he says, if no one had anything, what room would be left among them for giving? So remember, as, as we go through the, the New Testament, we are describing, and, and what is described for us is uh, the giving that comes from a, a cheerful heart, uh, the giving that comes out of understanding the, the work of Christ in our lives. Uh, so Clement of Alexandria is saying, hey, if, if they had already sold everything, then they would not have talked about giving of what we have etc. Um, and we are responsible to give to the work of the Lord. And there's, a, there's an excitement there and there's a joy there. Uh, you know, the old quip, give till it hurts. No, no, give till it feels good. Give till you understand the joy of what the Lord has done in your life, giving salvation. You want to give some of those things away. So look what he says in verse uh, 35. And they laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as they had need. Now, this is not a principle of equality, that they just gave out everything in equal measures. It's a principle of need, principle of need. The goods weren't divided up equally. Luke or the early church or Peter or John or the apostles aren't saying that it's inherently wrong for some to have more than others. But if you see your brother in Christ in need, uh, then we're called to, to help and, and to serve in whatever capacity we can out of love for one another. Notice also that Luke tells us uh, that they sold things. Barnabas here at the end of the passage uh, had sold a piece of property. 
Ananias and Sapphira, as we'll see next week, sold a piece of property and they, they did it a little bit differently, ran into trouble, we'll see. So it could hardly be right to engage in a free market economy of buying and selling if it was inherently wrong to own things. What Luke is describing here is, is different than, uh, say, the, the Essene community where the Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, to join that community, you had to divest yourself uh, of all your worldly goods, and you had to give it to them uh, to have ownership. Often you see that in uh, monastic life or the cloistered life. You, you divest yourself of your own personal property and give it to them. You see that sometimes in, in cults and sex, uh, where if you want to come and join us, you have to give us everything that you own and we'll become the stewards of it. Um, somebody's getting rich there. Somebody's getting rich there. Um, so we don't, uh, that's not what is said of the church. Now just remember the church had grown from a very small crowd to uh, very th thousands here and now in Jerusalem at this time. Um, it, it, up until about the middle of the 40s or 50s of the first century, uh, Jerusalem's in trouble. Well, this whole city is in trouble. It's not a prosperous time. There's been a famine, uh, lots of struggles. The historian Josephus tells us that Jerusalem had experienced famine, and deprivation, and need. And remember, Paul in his journeys a little bit later is taking up the collection for the church back in Jerusalem because the church in Jerusalem is in desperate straits. So many, and, and historically, many older Jews uh, who lived outside of Jerusalem, um, when they didn't have any other means of support, whether widows, etc., they would come back to Jerusalem and simply rely upon others within their community for care. Um, now, Paul, uh, Paul tells us in the first chapter of Corinthians that that God doesn't really call many mighty people. There weren't many wealthy people in the early church. Uh, there were a couple. Lydia is an example. Uh, Trader purple cloth, and purple cloth was highly valued. Um, but in comparison to us, as an example, many of those Christians in the first century had nothing had nothing. And, and, and those of us who have been to the uh, Dominican or to Mexico or to Haiti or any place like that, to Africa, and see the church and how much, how excited they are about their faith, even though they have nothing. And, and, they, and we think, well, how can they be so excited about their faith? Um, they don't even have air conditioning to worship. They don't need air conditioning to worship. They have the Lord in their hearts and they're very excited about that. But the fact of the matter is that there were probably many, many Christians in the church at that time who had very considerable needs, very considerable needs, and that there was a sense of concern for one another that developed in the early church. There was, uh, to the extent that verse 34 tells us, that there was not a needy person among them. So just think about that for a moment. Yes, there was, there was need within the church, and there were need within people's lives, but the church was meeting those needs. They were caring for one another. They were looking and saying, okay, this guy needs food for the week. We're going to provide that. Uh, this guy is looking for a job. We're going to help him find one, or all of those things. And this is a great testimony to the church at our day. A display of Christianity uh, lived out, not just in word, not just in their powerful preaching, but in their powerful love and care. They'd been forgiven of their sins. They'd been brought into this saving relationship with Christ. They'd also been brought into a family, and that was the family of Jesus Christ. They were brothers and sisters, and in the, this display of the work of the Holy Spirit, in a city where probably the needs were very great, the church stood out. The church stood out as countercultural in how they were caring for those around them, the extreme poor. Um, we think of, of how, in other ways, the church in the first century brought a countercultural change. We think of the elevation of the place of women uh, within Christianity. I mean, Christianity really changed the status of women uh, in the world, especially in the first century. 
No longer were they considered uh, to be property. No longer were they considered uh, uh, it's appropriate to abuse them in any uh, way. Remember what Paul said, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or free ma female. We're all one before our Lord. And also, the Christian, it was the Christians who went around and collected all the abandoned children, uh, especially the babies. Remember in the Roman culture, if uh, a baby was born and, and uh, it had a deformity, or if dad just didn't like it, the baby was put out basically to the curb. And it's the Christians who came by and collected these children and cared for them, as we see in Acts, uh, the command to make sure uh, we care for the widows and the orphans. So remember, these are people trying to find their identity as the church. This, this, they didn't know what to do. They, they were, in, in a sense, they were figuring it out day by day as it went along. And as long as they held to what the Lord said, as long as they did what the Lord had told them to do and held to the teachings of the apostles, then they really were successful. I mean, they're still Jewish in their culture. Uh, some of them may still be going to the synagogue uh, and, and, and trying to figure out when do I leave the synagogue and, and come to church, so to speak. They were, they were working it out literally day by day what the church is to look like and how they were to function in a society that really did not want Christianity and Christianity was countercultural to the Roman society in particular. So what a mishmash they were having, fits and starts and successes and failures, excitement and terror, all trying to work out what Christianity is supposed to be, what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to look like personally and what it was supposed to look like lived out in that community. And next week we're going to see a, a, one of the problems that they had of those who wanted to uh, declare their faith but not really live their faith. So See you next week as we look at chapter 5. So thank you.